Dermot, you've had huge success in America down through the years. Mm. Your love affair with American racing began before you ever started training, because mm. when you were qualifying as a vet, you That's spent right. time working there. I did indeed. I <clears throat> put myself through college, and some of the ways money was hard come by in those days. And uh, every summer, I used to go and work on the back stretch of New York as an assistant vet. And um, that's where I saw the Belmont, Saratogas, the aqueduct. And uh, that's where I learned my trade and at a very, very young age. And um, I saw a Belmont being run and I obviously realized it was the biggest race on the East Coast of the United States. In those days, they'd have maybe 120,000 people in Belmont Park. And of course, it entered my head that I always wanted to be a trainer. And if I ever was successful and lucky enough, I'd love to bring a horse back to win the Belmont. So that was the that was the kernel behind that one. And obviously, you were a hugely successful rider. We'll come to that in a while. But did you ride out a lot when you were in the States? Some of the, who oh, were some yeah. of the trainers you rode out for? Uh, going back in those days, I rode out for a man called Woody Stevens, who was one of the, the top... I worked as a vet and I also rode track work as well. It all helped to pay the, <laughs> <laughs> pay the way. And um, it, was, it was learning the tracks. I've, obviously, I've never yet had a runner in the Kentucky Derby, but I've been down to Churchill Downs and I've ridden track work in Churchill Downs. And, um, but Belmont I got to know very well. And from a, a training perspective, hmm. was to, that obviously helped you going forward as a trainer to mm. obviously you rode a lot of winners but to ride in those American tracks clockwork mm. uh, against the clock that obviously helped you when you started going training oh it definitely did I definitely did and then I was lucky I, I rode a winner actually in America but that was one of the hunt meets in Virginia but um, it did it, it was it definitely helped to form my whole knowledge of, of training and as I said, track work and speed. And yeah, it, was all, it all came together. And obviously when you started training in your early years, up until the present day, you had a lot of American owners mm. that you were training for here. So obviously you like to target some of their horses for some of the races in the States. I did. I, I think it was to try and attract American owners to come to race in Ireland in those days wasn't easy. But I developed those horses in Ireland and then brought them on. They graduated into stakes horses in America. And that's why I've been very fortunate to win so many group races, graded stakes, grade ones right across America, East Coast, Midwest, West Coast. Um, we've won grade ones all over America. And it wasn't the done thing back in those days, was it, for Irish trained horses to go over to the States to, no, to, no, to no. race and win? No, no, it didn't happen at all. But um, it, was, uh, it was the start of a momentum that has developed over the years. But I would have to say go and go was at the very beginning of it. And um, he started it all. How did that come about going on? <laughs> well, that's a long story, but he was a good two-year-old. He won, in, he won in Galway. Won that's a stakes race. Won a stakes race. <laughs> won a stakes race in the Curra. And um, I saw this race, the Laurel Futurity, which is a grade one on the turf for two-year-olds in America. And it shows how American racing was not that fashionable, the turf racing compared to the dirt and the weight turf racing in America has increasing dramatically in the last number of years, hence the spill on to the European sales of the number of yearlings being purchased this year to go to continue racing in America would set a record. But there was less emphasis on turf in America in those days. So I sent Go and Go out to run. We flew him from Dublin to Laurel into Washington and he was to run in the Laurel Futurity, grade one on the turf. It rained the night before and the race was taken off the turf and run in the dirt. And look, he'd come a long way and they wanted to know that I want to scratch him. And I said, no, 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 no he has to run. <laughs> and um, he duly ran and he duly won uh, the Laurel Futurity on the dirt. And about two weeks later, I always remember we, we sent him FedEx. He was the first horse thing to fly FedEx from there down uh, to Gulfstream in, um, in Florida. And uh, he ran a big race in the Breeders' Cup, two-year-old, which then you didn't have a choice of turf or dirt that was on the dirt. And uh, I think he finished fifth and ran beaten no distance. And I just said to myself, he's a horse now for some of the American classics next year for the Derby, Kentucky Derby or the Belmont. 
Which and again was unheard of. Oh, totally. But f- from Ireland, it just wasn't possible for us with the quarantine arrangements the following year to bring him, in my opinion, to have won the Kentucky Derby. It just wasn't possible. So much has changed over the years. The world has moved so much forward. It's very hard for people nowadays to believe, even when I brought Vintage Crop to Australia to win the Melbourne Cup, we had to wait a year to do that for all the quarantine to be put into place. So it wasn't possible. But what was possible was to go to New York and to go to Belmont and to quarantine there. So that was the target. Uh, I said, we'll have a crack at the, at the Belmont stakes. How, um, how did his preparation go for Belmont? How did he condition the horse? He won in the Phoenix Park. He was around the turf in Ireland and then mm. he got to America for a mile and a half dirt race. Well, we knew he would handle the dirt. Mm. And uh, so he was, that wasn't a concern. And it was just a matter of in those days, if you just trained him on the grass or we trained him on the wood bark all weather mm. and uh, prepared him the same as you prepare him for any race. Did the Americans respect you when we went over that day? They probably respected because they looked at the record of Michael Canaan and myself of what we were achieving in Europe mm. and therefore they would have respected us. Did they think we would win? Definitely not. <laughs> With no happen. chance. No, no. Might be nice guys, but you, you know what I mean. <laughs> um, no, no. There was there was a couple of very wise comments made. You know what I mean. We, <laughs> How but, did the race go? It was a very straightforward watch for you to stand. Still? Yeah, you know, Mick had studied detail how he'd ride the horse. Everything went according to plan, and the horse was very, very well. He was. I had him just at his peak. I always remember he was based over in the aqueduct. I remember going out on the lawn and watching him. He used to specialise in eating dandelions and the horse would go around looking for wherever there's a dandelion. So he was, he was a very interesting individual, mm. but he was very tough go and go. He was ruthlessly tough, very good racehorse. And um, Mick gave him the perfect ride. He ran the seventh fastest time, which is so important in America, mm. for, for a, a Belmont. And of course, we had to beat the Kentucky Derby winner in Bridled, unbridled, but... Um, was never in doubt. He won by seven and a half lengths and uh, it was a very special day. Were you surprised with how far he won on the day, genuinely going? No, yeah. Were you expecting a performance like that or were you more hopeful rather than confident? You were trying to achieve what had never been achieved before. You're more hopeful than confident. You, you know, that's all you can be because the hype for a Belmont in America and the Kentucky Derby winner was the favourite, obviously, and I think the Preakness winner this horse coming over from Ireland was kind of a novelty and was a nice addition to the race and as I said we're nice guys to come but, <laughs> but that's you <laughs> but you're not going to win and uh, but he had a very big Irish following and uh, we'd obviously give a good press up to the race and uh, there was a there was a huge attendance I always remember that day and a great Irish attendance and it got a wonderful reception and it was a very special performance. And owned by a brilliant man as well. It was so so integral uh, in your career, the late uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Wal- Hefner of Mike Lair. It just couldn't have happened without Walter Hefner because he gave me the confidence to go forward to do all of this. He gave me the encouragement to go and do this and uh, gave him huge personal satisfaction. And I was thrilled for Mr. Hefner. And that makes it so much easier when you have a plan to have mm. people behind you who encourage that confidence because mm. it makes the decisions that bit easier, doesn't it? It does indeed. And uh, Walter Hefner <clears throat> wasn't just a good owner. He was a wonderful friend of mine. And uh, he was an integral part of Irish racing and everything that was good about Irish racing. And Dermot, go and go when he won the Belmont. Mm. Could you believe what had happened? I... Uh, we we knew we had a very very big chance of winning this race. I can tell you. So you're more you're more confident at home. <laughs> we knew that that we had a very very good horse that was would handle the track. I had a Michael Canaan, the ideal jockey. He believed this could be done, and that's such an important part. And he gave him a brilliant ride, and the horse responded. Just on Mick on that day. I've read it before. He didn't arrive to the race until late on. You thought he'd be there early walking his box. Mm. He was in the hotel room having a snooze, I think. <laughs> well, that was typical Mick. I was wondering where the hell he was and there was no sign of him. <laughs> no, 
not flustered at all. Not at all. Not at all. Just another race, the same as when we won the Melbourne Cups or different other races. Totally relaxed, but confident. Had all his homework done. Highly professional. And um, look, we were hopeful we could win, but um, we had all our homework done. And Darvish, um hasn't been done since. No. Look, it will be done, but I'm surprised it hasn't been done since, to be quite honest. But um, some have tried and have failed. It's not easy. You've got to have the right horse, the horse that will handle that dirt surface. And you have to have a very adaptable horse, and that's what Go and Go was. You have to sacrifice your European three-year-old campaign, maybe, as well. Is that the True. risk factor in it, I suppose? Maybe? Yeah, I just thought the way he handled, when he won the Laura Futurity, the way he handled the dirt impressed me an awful lot that day. I said, this is going to be a good horse as a three-year-old, but he can be a serious grade one winner in America if we go that route. Of all your many great achievements, winning the Belmont Stakes, never been done since. Does that mm. rank right up there with well, it the... Has to, yeah, it has to. the very top. Yeah, it does. It has to, definitely. And I'm sure, as I said, like everything in life, it will be done. But it's, it'll, it won't be done that often because you just need the right horse to do it and you just need a very adaptable horse and that's what he was and uh, yeah it's it right up there and Dermot going back to America mm. you've had numerous numerous good horses good winners down there down through mm. the years Dimitrov was a very good filly dressed yep. the trill won the matriarch yeah. Pine Dance, Jazz sure. Beat, Simple Exchange, Winchester. Yeah. So many good horses yeah. and so many big wins in the States, all over the States. Sure, all over. Zukova won the Man of War. Uh, Johnny Velasquez gave her a lovely ride. I'd like to just pick out on the West Coast, the Matriarch with Pat Smullen. Uh, that was Andres de Trill, and she was a very good filly. And um, I think it was one of the best rides Pat Smullen ever gave. Now, he only won a neck and a neck, but in doing so, we beat the two best fillies in America at the time. And it was just a brilliant ride from Pat Smullen. Uh, Why was it such a good ride? It was such a good ride because she was at the end of the long year for the filly. It was November. And she'd had a very successful season for us, but she had a long, hard season. And he basically coaxed her to win. That's the best way to put it. It wasn't that he made her win. He coaxed her up to win. And it was just a wonderful confidence ride from Pat. And Don, we're going back to your travels, Mel mm. Melbourne Cup. It's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful story. Vintage craft. Talk about thinking outside the box. As you said at the start of this interview, that the world has changed so much. Ah, yeah, yeah. Uh, explain to us how you got vintage <laughs> craft, because it is a great story too, Melbourne. Yeah, well, I worked as a vet in Australia. And I happened to be there at the time of a Melbourne Cup and I realised probably more than most people what a big occasion it is in the Southern Hemisphere. And naturally there was jokes that if I ever trained horses, I'd love to bring a horse back to win the Melbourne Cup. But in those days, most Australians believed it was not possible for any non-Australian horse, maybe New Zealand, but certainly not <laughs> not up our way, <laughs> to ever come back and do it. Uh, that you couldn't travel a horse to Australia and hope to win the Melbourne Cup. It was ludicrous. That's all about it. And anyway, their horses, usually they had to run in the McKinnon on the Saturday to win on the Melbourne Cup on the Tuesday. So they run 10 furlongs on the Saturday to set them up for the Melbourne Cup on the, on the two days later, three days later. And we wanted to bring a horse from Ireland that hadn't run for six weeks and we hoped to win the Melbourne Cup. So you knew what chance they thought we had. But there was a lot of, it's a long, long story, but it's, it, we knew we had the horse. And um, we knew when he won in Tralee, the Bass Gold Cup, the year before, mile and six, he won by six lengths. And Mick Canan just said to me, this is our horse for Australia. Because we'd always, both of us, had thought we'd love to have a horse for Australia to win a Melbourne Cup. And he went on to win the English Cesar, which very easily that autumn, because we couldn't bring him to Australia, because it was not possible to bring horses from Europe to race in Australia in those days. Although I entered him in the Melbourne Cup and I got a reaction because of entering him and he got a very light weight. He'd have won the Melbourne Cup the year before he actually won it, but it was physically not possible to bring him there. Why was that? Two reasons. Firstly, the quarantine. Because if, if he went there, he would have to quarantine the quarantine station in Sydney, 
with the other stallions and other horses that went there, which had been a couple of weeks just in a quarantine station, just being laid out each day or on the taken care of there. He couldn't go and train on a racetrack. Mm -hmm. So that wasn't practical. Mm -hmm. That was one reason. And the second was to do with the flight of the airplanes, because in those days it was a much longer flight and you had to go over the American continent to get to Australia because planes, they were afraid by going the more direct route in case they had to land on the African continent, they was worried about African horse sickness. So the planes all tended to go the other direction, which would make the flight, in my opinion, too long. So over the coming year, with the help of a lot of people from the Department of Agriculture in Canberra, in Australia, uh, in Europe, and um, everywhere, we managed to achieve those two things, to get the flight path for the planes changed, and also the quarantine, where we could quarantine horses at a racetrack where racing wasn't taking place, and Sandown, which was the track in Melbourne that wasn't being used at the time. That's where drum taps and vintage crop uh, with the first two horses ever to quarantine there. It nearly went wrong. You've rerouted the planes, you've done everything, you're on the way to Dublin Airport and it nearly never took off. Yeah, it was even slightly before that. We had everything planned to precision and one thing went wrong. I did not allow for fog. And <laughs> even, even you can't control that now. It's <laughs> we had, it was arranged for, from quarantine. You must remember he's in quarantine. So we had to fly from from Dublin to Heathrow and connect with the flight bringing him from Heathrow to Australia. And um, but the problem was he would, that flight was leaving at midnight from Heathrow and it was planned that he would leave Dublin, I think, about seven o'clock that evening on a Sunday evening, that everything had to be timed to precision. But there was fog and the plane bringing him from Dublin to London was based in England and it was in Liverpool Airport. That's as far as it got. And it was waiting to fly into Dublin. But as I've learned, it's much easier to um, take off in fog than to land in fog. Mm. And um, I wasn't aware of that. <laughs> and cut a long story short, we waited and waited. And the pilot, who was brilliant, and uh, he just waited to see if, if he could. He came over, he flew around, he couldn't land and they had to go back. And then he came a second time. And if he could find to use their own technology, a hole in the fog. And it looked very, very doubtful that the plane could land because it was an extremely foggy evening. And the problem was, you might say, well, you go the following day. Well, we can't because the cargo flight he was going from out of London out of Heathrow, that only goes once a week. And the following week would not, we still had to do, we were in two weeks quarantine in Ireland. We had to do a further two weeks quarantine in Australia when we got there. Mm. So we'd be out of sync time-wise. So it was now or never. And I remember walking across my path from my house to the yard and thinking, you know, this is probably all for the best because this whole venture is too risky. And maybe everybody's right. It is stupid. Expensive, I'd say. Too. Very expensive. Mm -hmm. uh, everything, too much risk involved. This horse is just too much to ask everybody to. We're really doing this a few years too soon. And maybe it'll be a blessing in disguise if it doesn't happen. It'll save an awful lot of, <laughs> an awful <laughs> lot of, an awful lot of cost. It'll save an awful lot of time, and most people will be proven right that it wasn't possible to do it anyway. And lo and behold, it was the early days of mobile phones. I got a call to say, good news. Pilot has made it, found a hole in the fog and got into Dublin Airport. Get that horse up here as quick as you can. And the rest is history. <laughs> and when you, went to, when you went to Australia, I remember reading about it and Mick Canaan telling us as well the stories. The Australians laughed at you because you basically were doing very little with him. That's right. Of a morning on the racetrack. They said well, this couldn't happen. The fun thing was Frankie the Tory was riding drum taps. He was the other horse. Drum taps and vintage crop were the first two. They were the trailblazers of world horse international racing. And um, drum taps and Frankie, as you can well imagine, put on a very good performance in their pre-race workouts. And Frankie was the joy of the media 
in Australia and naturally expected to win. And uh, Michael Canan and I were probably taking more back seat. And uh, we were just doing our own thing with our horse. And uh, we weren't just quite as unflamboyant <laughs> as, <laughs> as Frankie <laughs> and confident. But we had a quite confidence that this could be done and uh, we wouldn't have been there. But uh, so they got all the pre all the publicity. And uh, in fact, I think the Australians were quite disappointed with our horse because he didn't travel as well as I'd hoped. And that was the big worry. I, I had confidence in my horse having the ability to win, mm. but I was disappointed with the way he traveled. And it took him a few days to pick up and to eat. And he wasn't drinking as well as I wanted him to. And fluid loss was going to be a big concern and dehydration. And uh, so we took our time. Uh, we had three weeks, I think it was, to the race. So the first week he did practically nothing. And uh, we found a place where we could graze him. And um, gradually he picked up. He enjoyed the warm weather. Gradually we got his fluid base back. And uh, we did little bits of work with him, little short bits of work with him, but nothing impressive. And obviously the Australian media wanted to see these two horses doing major workouts and we weren't doing that. So obviously they were of the opinion there must be something wrong with him when he's not, you know, breezing him and he's not working him hard. And when's he going to appear for a public workout? And I said, he won't. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know what's wrong. He wasn't know who this mad Irish man was. Yeah, along, so yeah? the story's going around, there's something wrong with the horse, you know. Well, I said, other oh, than he hasn't travelled well, that's all. But he, he'll be all right on the day. But they, <laughs> they, uh, I'm still laughing because I think of, of how positive Frankie was about drum shops. <laughs> and as you know, Mick Canad, Mick was being careful, cautious. <laughs> and, uh, uh, Mick had flown in from Hong Kong where he was riding so successfully. Yeah. And, um, we were certainly the the underdogs. We were the ones that we were 28 to 1. And uh, now we had been back from 80 to 1. That's how Vintage Crop was 80 to 1 for the Melbourne Cup. But on the day, he went off at 28 to 1. And uh, if ever a horse got a reception, I can tell you, I never, and I've trained four, nearly 4,500 winners, I've never had a horse get the reception that he got when I won my first Melbourne Cup. Because the number of Irish in Melbourne that day, they just took it over. What if what you're standing in the winner's enclosure, 120,000 people there, mm. you've achieved what everybody thought was unachievable. Mm. What was your emotion? Again, it's, it's hard to put it into words. It's the satisfaction of a job well done. Rather than getting wildly excited, it's just the sheer personal satisfaction of having achieved something that I always thought was doable and something that many years before, when I worked as a teenager, in Australia, the one day I could come back and win a Melbourne Cup. Then, as you know, we're fortunate to win a second one. But this was the first one. And um, the, the enjoyment that it gave everybody and the satisfaction that it gave others uh, meant as much to me. And then the huge number of Irish people that were there and all kinds of stories. One very quickly, a guy, naturally there's controls and people are came, you know, the stewards are keeping people back and one guy had a hold of me by the coat and he wouldn't let me go. <laughs> and he tried to explain to me that he had a mortgage on his house. He was very Irish and he was in serious financial problems. And he had backed the horse, Vintage Crop, all the way from 80 to 1 down and actually cleared his mortgage. And I promise you, I can stay in his house to this day <laughs> whenever I want to go to Australia. And I get a Christmas card from him every Christmas. Really? So that was only a tiny story of it. And then I was fortunate. Uh, I received from the Lord Mayor of Melbourne. A few days later, presented me with the key to the city of, of Melbourne. So uh, that, was, that was something that I am very proud of. And Dermot? The, you got the key to the city three or four days later, but post race from talking to Mick Canan and mm. they were in shell shocked. The Australians just couldn't believe that this had happened. Yeah, it, it, it's hard nowadays. It, again, it's how the world has changed. This could not be done in their opinion, if you know what I mean. It was, it was just not possible. And the big thing was he hadn't raced for six weeks. And that was unheard of in those days. He had to run. 
Mm. If he's going to win, he had to run three days before the race over a short trip. Just break the mold. You, the it, exactly. The mold, yeah. And if he wasn't going to do that, he had to show a major, be clocked and show a major workout close to the race. Mm. This horse had come from Ireland and he won an Irish St. Ledger over a mile and six in soft ground probably. And you know what I mean? He, he probably shouldn't even be in the race. Mm. You know what I mean? And while Mick was, we now know, world-class rider, and there was nobody better than him riding in the race, but he'd been riding in Hong Kong, which they were aware of, mm. but he wasn't really known to the Australian punter or the Australian race score. So, you know, this was new. And for you yourself, post-race, you, you were telling stories about your time in Australia, and mm. there was a certain poem that you alluded to knowing and they called you out on it. Yeah, that's true. And you always know, as you learn when you're doing media <laughs> interviews, post-race like this here. I, can, I knew so, there's always something. The interviewer is always keeping something. <laughs> there's no different. Give but, us a dig there. Oh. <laughs> we, we haven't got to the good stuff yet. No, no, no. <laughs> and, oh, it's always easy with the, I'm very fortunate out through the years, with the racing journalists and in, interviews. And you're always waiting for the difficult question. <laughs> and one non-racing journalist asked me, why on earth did I bring this horse to Australia? And what got me so interested in Australia? And I explained to him when I was eight years of age, I got a book of poetry on the outback of Australia. It belonged to their famous, written by Banjo Patterson, who was their famous poet laureate of Australia. And I don't think he funny, fully believed me because he asked me if I could recite can you recite one? I said, I could. And he said, will you recite a non-racing one? And that was a little bit of a concern. <laughs> and I just said to him, I said one called the, the Bush Christening. And I just said, on the outer Barku, where churches are few and men of religion are scanty, <laughs> on a road never crossed, set by folks that are lost, when Michael McGee had a shanty. <laughs> And to be fair, the media all just stood up. And I literally had Australia in the palm of my hand. <laughs> and, I did that. and I said, I got the key to the city of Melbourne four days later from the Lord Mayor. It went, it went from like that. And it hasn't stopped. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> a media puzzle then a few years later, obviously, yeah. the world had changed. It was a lot easier to get media puzzle to Australia. Yeah. He went with Vinnie Rowe. Yeah, he Profound did. Beauty had run in a Melbourne Cup oh, as well. True, true, true. Things had change in a relatively short period yeah, of time. Yeah, the world starts moving forward and uh, we, we kind of cling on to the world as it changes and it was a lot easier to bring horses and by the way, it is, even then there were complications and problems but it got easier. Uh, Vinnie Roll was the horse that I brought from Melbourne Cup that deserved to win mm. and I know it was great we won with Media Puzzle but I really wanted Vinnie Roll to have won a Melbourne Cup for everybody, for Jim Sheridan, his great owner, for the horse, and especially for Pat Smola. And um, he carried top weight and he was unlucky. He ran into a wonderful mare called Mackie Vidiva and she won three Melbourne Cups at that time. And the first year we were trying to give her, I think it was five pounds or seven pounds, seven pounds we were giving her. And I always say she got the run up the inside and that maybe some of the colleague Australian jockeys, as their horses tired, they drifted off the rail and they let the winning rider a lovely run up the inside. And she just got up to beat Vinnie Rowe. Pat gave Vinnie Rowe a perfect ride. But McAvee Diva just got the run of the race and just caught and going to the line. But the year we won with Media Puzzle, we had Vinnie Rowe as well. And that was one of my happiest moments racing because turning for home, the two horses were there. One was in front and the other was third and then he went second. And I looked back as you would and I could see no dangers really. They were all under pressure behind them. And I said, we're going to run one, two in the Melbourne Cup with the two horses. As it turned out, again, poor Vinnie Rowe, he top weight. And he was given 12 pounds to media puzzle and he just couldn't give him the weight. And Damien Oliver, of course, rode, um, rode the winner. A medium puzzle, he just improved. Hmm. No end. I actually remember he got beat. His last run here in Ireland sure. was a handicap. Yeah. The Curra. Lowlander won it. That's right. A good memory. I think most of the lads in the yard, including myself, we were very <laughs> depressed the following day because we'd all back me the puzzle. <laughs> yeah. He got beat. He goes into quarantine. He goes and wins the Geelong Cup. Geelong Cup. Geelong Cup. And yeah. then 
wins the... Could you see that coming? I, I saw him the year before that. He ran the English St. Ledger. And I remember saying to Mike Dillon, there's my next Melbourne Cup winner. Because although he was fourth in the English Ledger, he was basically, I always thought, a 10 to 12 furlong horse. But the way he stayed on at the end of the mile and six in Doncaster, that's what impressed me. And uh, we kind of minded his handicap, Mark. And uh, he had so well that we had to, to get into the race. Uh, we had to qualify. And hence, we ran in the Geelong Cup. And um, the rest is history. He duly won the Geelong Cup. He loved the warm weather. He loved fast ground. And um, as I said, it was a very emotional time for Damien Oliver at the time. He just lost his brother. Mm. And um, he duly won. How did you treat Damien Oliver that day or leading up to the race? Do you just put your arm around and say, listen, you're going well, to... When, I, when I got off, It's a good question. When I got off the plane at Tullamarine Airport in Melbourne, I couldn't believe all the media <clears throat> hype on the media were there. And all the one question, they didn't want to really know about me or about media puzzle was Damien Oliver if he doesn't ride the horse who's going to ride uh, will it be an Australian jockey will it be an Irish jockey who are you bringing out who's available and I just said look I said I'm going to wait on Damien um, it appears after us he, he was watching that interview I said I'm going to give Damien all the time he needs it's been a very very tragic time for him and uh, I said I'll wait as long as I can for him because he's the rider I want to ride this horse he's won the Geelong Cup on him and uh, I'd hope that he would be able to ride this horse but I want no pressure on Damien he'll make up his own mind when he's ready and um, I think 24 or 48 hours later Damien called me and said yeah I want to ride um, that let him out of that was it and of course they made a movie out of it then so yeah. were, you, were you happy with how you turned out in it? oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, Brendan Gleeson was a was a good guy to to, to play me in the movie, and he, he put a lot of effort into it. He came down here, spent a, spent a couple of days here with me, and uh, movie's a movie. It's I suppose eighty percent of it is true, and there's twenty percent of it added on. You know, I think it's a good movie. I it's it was uh, at the time it was good. Yeah, I enjoyed watching it. Hong Kong, another place you conquered very early on in your career, or ver in the very early days very of early. Hong Kong international yeah. racing. We were the first into Hong Kong, Mick Kanan and myself. Um, yeah, we, we sent two horses to the first Hong Kong invitation race meeting. There was only two Group 1 invitation races in Hong Kong. And um, we sent two, and we won with one, and we're second with the other. And Mick rode additional risk in the seven furlong Hong Kong it was bowl in those days. And he set a track record for Hong Kong. They went very, very quick, as you know so well. Mm. And Mick took his time on him, as Mick does, and brought him with a long run down the middle of the track. And uh, that was our first runner, and he won. And our next was a horse called Prudent Manor. And he ran, ran in the Hong Kong Cup over a mile and a quarter and ran second. And uh, it was just a very special day. And... Uh, Hong Kong racing and the whole international day has just gone forward over the years. So, uh, but now it all started there. And it meant that um, Mick then got the, got the job in Hong Kong, which he did exceptionally well. Uh, they wanted me to go and train there, really? but I decided to stay at home. And uh, yeah, it was, it was a very, very big occasion, very big for international racing, mm. that these two horses from Ireland went to Hong Kong and won these two big races. Was that a very tempting offer at the time, to go train in Hong Kong? It was. What I tried to do was, if I would, could go from, let's say, a certain part of their season, that I could be back in Ireland for the 1st of March. And their season was much shorter than it is now, and that I could train for part of the year in Ireland and part of the year in Hong Kong. That was what I, I tried to uh, see if we could work on. and. Uh, it it just didn't work out. So so you obviously thought long and hard about the offer to go to Hong I Kong. I thought about it because you must remember there was very little money in Irish racing in those days. Our prize money and everything was very, very, very low. And um, there was huge incentives to train in Hong Kong, the same as I could have trained in Australia for the leading owner of Australia or Alan Paulson in America. But... Uh, 
you could have you were offered to go to Lots Australia and yeah. America as ah, well. yeah. when you're winning all these races in America you're going to get these offers okay. mm. and Alan Polson was the leading owner of America he had a huge number of horses and uh, he wanted me to go and train for him there did you ever think strongly about that? Not really, because he had a huge number of horses spread between East Coast, West Coast, Midwest. And um, no, I suppose not. No, I gave a consideration, mm. of course. The same as Robert Sangster wanted me to train for him in England. Did and he? he did indeed. And that was something that for both, again, Michael Kinnan and myself, something that we would consider. It was a package deal, two for the price of one. I don't know, but anyway, <laughs> <laughs> we weren't a bad combination anyway. <laughs> And I never knew that about uh, Robert Sangster wanting uh, you to go. Was that the train in Manton? Manton in Manton, okay. yeah, true indeed. But um, no, we're happy with what we achieved here. And, and that's probably another reason then, as I was staying in Ireland, that I'd like to go around the world to win races around the world. And Dermot, you'd make Canaan, Wally Swinburne prior to him, Pat Smullen for a long time. How did you come out and face Kevin there to write after that? <laughs> <laughs> I think he had a good I think he had a good strike rate for me, hadn't you, Kevin? <laughs> he had a great strike rate. I couldn't a big amateur race in Galway. Yeah. Oh, plenty of winners around Galway. You did, you did. No, no, <laughs> no. I, 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 30 winners for you. He did. No, no, his strike rate was pretty high. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I remember one day in Galway, I killed Chris Ann in the bumper. He told me to jump my fourth or fifth. I'll never forget, J.D. Moore wiped me out at the start. Went by the winning post, I think it was 16th at the time, and all I had in my head was, he's going to absolutely kill me. <laughs> I think it was 5-4 to four favourite. Yeah, they'd all lorry down, turn into the straight, took off like a Razzie down the hill, the game was over. Aidan Fitzgerald hangs off the bend, just mm -hmm. as I'm coming as outside, land up in the, in the betting ring. <laughs> Pulled up, all I wanted to do was just get down off the horse and run. And I'll never forget the guy, Peter Ryan, used to look after him. Yeah. Caught the horse and he says to me, the boss is going to kill you. I said, Peter. <laughs> I said, I do not need you to tell me that. <laughs> you oh. eyeball me all the way back into number four. I'd say half an hour later, I was still getting a good bollock and off yet. I rang, I rang dad on the way home. I said, I'm gone out of Wells. I said, I may go to Francis Crowley's every day of the week. So I'd say it was the first time I was ever early for you. Next morning, I was in around 20 minutes there. I said, I get in before he sees me, you know. Into the yard, who's the first one of me? And, oh no, here we go again. <laughs> And uh, he said, oh, good to see you got home all right last night. I know, what? <laughs> and that's one thing about you, to be fair. When you gave yeah. us a good telling off, we knew where we stood. It was never forgotten, but it was never mentioned again. Is that a fair synopsis? Ah, yeah, it is. You move on. Mm. You know what I mean? I don't, I, I say what I have to say, and that's the end of it.